Hello, my name is Linda Lawrence. I'm an ophthalmologist and have worked with birth to three programs and with children with low vision, blindness, and multiple disabilities for over 25 years. This talk is an introduction to the syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia, or ONH. I want to emphasize the diagnosis of ONH includes a spectrum of visual impairment and developmental delays and also to present a practical approach for assessment and interventions for the transdisciplinary team. The objectives of this presentation are to bring a general understanding of the syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia, to review the diagnosis, symptoms, etiology, and risk factors for development associated with the diagnosis. Also, realizing a child is not a diagnosis but a diagnosis gives us strategies for intervention and helps to define what our roles are as vision professionals or other members of the intervention team. Let's review the latest evidence for the syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia and determine how we apply this for our babies, students, and families to enhance learning, independence, and quality of life. ONH is emerging as a leading single cause of childhood blindness and visual impairment in the USA and Europe. Cranial nerve 2, the optic nerve, is actually directly synapsed or connected with the brain, unlike any of the other cranial nerves. The diagnosis is clinical. There are small optic nerves that are seen on examination of the eyes. An ophthalmologist uses direct visualization of the optic nerves and performs examination. Neuroimaging such as MRI or CT scanning is not adequate to make the diagnosis of ONH. One or both optic nerves may be effective. ONH may be isolated or part of other functional and anatomical abnormalities of the central nervous system. There is an increasing frequency of ONH for uncertain reasons. There is a diverse impact on growth and development of the child. The interventions for each child depend on the degree of visual impairment and associated conditions. Functional vision is the way each child uses vision to learn. This includes activities of daily life, near vision tasks, communication interaction, and movement in space. Despite similar diagnoses, each child sees differently, as in the case of these two children with optic nerve hypoplasia. The child on the left has normal vision function after strabismus surgery, and the other has visual field loss requiring cane travel for independence. Visual acuity may be from no light perception to near normal. One or both eyes may be affected. 80% are bilateral, two-thirds asymmetrical, and 80% of children are legally blind. Visual function cannot be predicted from the clinical or radiological appearance of the optic nerves nor from the initial examination. Children may have superimposed amblyopia, which can be caused by asymmetry in any part of the eye and can lead to strabismus, um, coexisting anisometropia can it exist. In the first few years of life, there may be improvement in vision. Reasons are uncertain. It may be because of improved axonal function due to optic nerve myelination in the first four years of life. Also, we see improved use of residual vision with intervention. In regards to functional vision, nystagmus may be noted when both eyes are effective, typically developing at one to three months of age. Strabismus may be noted in the first year of life, typically esotropia. Those with unilateral optic nerve hypoplasia may present with strabismus rather than nystagmus. There may be variable visual field defects dependent on multiple factors, including the extent of optic nerve hypoplasia, whether there's optic chiasmal involvement, optic tract involvement, or other brain involvement such as schizencephaly or effects from hydrocephalus. There may be variable color vision deficiencies as in any other optic nerve disorder. What is optic nerve hypoplasia? The definition of hypoplasia is a condition of arrested development in which an organ or part remains below the normal size or in an immature state. The optic nerve is a collection of thousands of nerve fibers transmitting signals from the eye to the brain where you see. Optic nerve hypoplasia is a congenital anomaly. The optic nerve is underdeveloped. 
and there's excessive loss of neurons before the nerve is fully developed. It is non-progressive. The nerve may be just small and not dysplastic. The anatomy of the visual system is very complicated and beyond the scope of this discussion. However, we must remember that the optic nerve is a collection of thousands of nerve fibers that transmit visual signals from each eye to the brain. The optic disc refers to the portion of the optic nerve visible with the ophthalmoscope by looking inside the dilated eye. Diagnosis is by direct ophthalmoscopy. This is a clinical diagnosis. There are small optic discs. Newer scanning methods may change the way we measure and diagnose optic nerve hypoplasia. If you compare the two optic discs in the photographs, you can see the difference in the size. With the slide left being a normal size optic nerve and slide right showing a small optic nerve. Sometimes it's more difficult to diagnose optic nerve hypoplasia in a child when both eyes are small and symmetrical. Optic nerve hypoplasia should not be confused with optic nerve atrophy. Other names for this are optic nerve pallor or pale optic nerve. However, they may coexist. Who diagnoses optic nerve hypoplasia? The neonatologist sees the baby because of an unstable nursery course. In the neonatal period, jaundice, hypoglycemia, apnea, seizures, and failure to thrive or other developmental delays may signal pituitary gland dysfunction or hypothalamic dysfunction. And the neonatologist might suspect the syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia and ask the ophthalmologist to see the baby in the nursery. So the ophthalmologist may initially examine the baby on referral from the neonatologist. Both ophthalmologists and neonatologists may see the baby because the syndrome is part of other systemic conditions or because the baby is considered high risk. The ophthalmologist may also examine the baby later once out of the nursery as nystagmus, esotropia, or other signs of poor vision appear in apparently healthy infant. What is septo-optic dysplasia, or SOD? Septo-optic dysplasia means optic nerve hypoplasia with the absence of the septum pellucidum. The septum pellucidum is a midline structure in the brain. It is now known that the absence of the septum pellucidum does not impart risk for the collection of problems found in optic nerve hypoplasia, and that associated problems are due to miswiring of the brain, especially in the hypothalamus. These abnormalities may not be detected with neuroimaging. A newer suggested definition is syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia. Why do you get optic nerve hypoplasia and associated neurological changes? We really don't know what causes this condition or why the diagnosis is on the rise. There is something that happens at three to six weeks of gestation. It is uncertain if it's environmental, teratogenic, or genetic. The epidemiology and course of optic nerve hypoplasia is being investigated by Dr. Mark Borscher at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. Prenatal risk factors are still not proven. We don't know what causes optic nerve hypoplasia. There is an association with young mothers and firstborn children. There are spatial clusters, but all the other presumed etiologies have not been shown to be statistically significant. In the baby's count, 2012 nation, national data, a 11% of the sample size had optic nerve hypoplasia. This makes it the third most leading cause of visual impairment in the newborn to three population in the United States after cortical visual impairment and retinopathy of prematurity. What tests should be ordered? Why do we order these tests and what do we do with the information? MRIs 
findings are not diagnostic. High resolution MRI may change this. If there are focal signs, neuroimaging should be ordered early. This is to rule out other surgically treatable diseases. If there are no other focal signs, then it's still recommended to have neuroimaging by the age of two. There's agenesis of the septum pellucidum in 38%, but this is not associated with hypopituitarism or developmental day in prospective studies. The absence of septum pellucidum is not predictive. There may be pituitary gland malformation. This is predictive of hormonal dysfunction. There is a high instance of hormonal dysfunction in the syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia, but only 13% have abnormal pituitary glands on MRI scan. There may be hypoplasia or agenesis of the corpus callosum, and this may be associated with cognitive, motor, adaptive behavior deficits, but not pituitary gland dysfunction. The hypothalamus is poorly imaged on MRI. Again, this may change in the future. Newer imaging modalities show abnormalities in the optic tracts of all children with optic nerve hypoplasia, which were thought to have had otherwise normal MRI scans. We are unsure of the significance. Electrophysiology is sometimes recommended. However, we have found that ERG may be normal and is not helpful, and visual evoke response or VR may be helpful but not predictive. Isolated optic nerve hypoplasia is uncommon even when neuroimaging is normal. Again, there are associated developmental midline brain abnormalities and the pituitary hormones may be affected due to defects in the hypothalamus, the pituitary infundibulum, or the pituitary gland. Unilateral optic nerve hypoplasia carries a 69% risk of hypothalamic and pituitary dysfunction and a 39% risk of associated developmental delay. In bilateral optic nerve hypoplasia, 81% of the children have hypothalamic or pituitary dysfunction, and 78% have developmental delay. Hypopituitarism, or low output of the pituitary gland, or sometimes called panhypopit, means that more than two hormones may be lacking. So what are the hormones and why do teachers need to know? 75 to 80 percent of patients with optic nerve hypoplasia have hypopituitarism in some form. In lack of growth hormones, 70 percent may have stunted growth. They may have short stature. They may have hypoglycemic events including seizures. They may have prolonged jaundice as babies. They may have micropenis and delayed dentition. The hypothyroidism occurring in optic nerve hypoplasia at an incidence of 43% is a secondary dysfunction. The child may have poor growth, again prolonged jaundice, delayed puberty, and the thyroid hormones are very important for cerebral development and attaining developmental milestones. Hypothyroid may be missed at neonatal screenings that use only TSH or thyroid um, stimulating hormone as a measurement. Hypothyroid can cause additional brain damage if not detected early. This is one of the most important tests for the infant suspected of having optic nerve hypoplasia. Adrenal insufficiency can occur in 27 percent and this can lead to death from cardiovascular collapse and there is sudden death in 2 percent of children with ONH. The child may also have cholecystasis, jaundice, and hypoglycemia. Diabetes insipidus, a lack of vasopressin, can occur in 5%, and this causes abnormal fluid balance. The good news is, if we detect the abnormal pituitary function, there are hormones available to be administered. This is done in conjunction with a pediatrician and pediatric endocrinologist. How long should we monitor the pituitary functions? These endocrine features may develop early or late. Data is very important to help us sort this out. There should be monitoring of growth at regular intervals. 
There should be monitoring through puberty and maybe even into adulthood. There should be regular checks of thyroid function. No one really knows for sure at this point. Hypothalamic dysfunction is a loss of regulation of homeostatic mechanisms controlling behavior and pituitary gland function. This includes diurnal rhythms, feeding, temperature regulation, all due to miswiring in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls the autonomic system. Control of thirst and hunger may be abnormal, and feeding behaviors including overeating with obesity, poor eating with wasting, and aversion to certain food textures may exist. Water seeking behavior may be mistaken for diabetes insipidus. The biological clock may have loss of rhythmicity and sleep patterns may cause disruption to family life and difficulties at school. Body temperature regulations may also be affected. The long-term outlook for each child depends on the uniqueness of each child. Visual impairment is variable. Developmental and intellectual delays are variable. Other neurological conditions are variable. Endocrine status is variable, and there may be variable hypothalamic signs. Each child needs to be assessed and followed as an individual. Autism spectrum disorders may coexist with the syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia. There is a new modified ADOS and ADIR for children with visual impairment in a recent published study. There's wide debate in the literature why children with a variety of visual disorders are at risk for behavioral and social communication disorders. There's a possible association with white matter abnormalities. Studies published with isolated optic nerve hypoplasia, normal vision or minimal impairment, show abnormal optic tract and right ventral cingulum or part of the limbic system with association of behavioral disorders. Much more research is needed in this area. The goals of pediatric vision rehabilitation are to maximize function, to enhance educational potential, increase independence, and improve quality of life regardless of each child's abilities. Visual impairment can affect the child's daily life and is illustrated by the four-leaf clover of vision. The child's vision is used for development of communication skills, moving in space, daily living skills, and other sustained near vision tasks. The quality of image for the child with visual impairment from optic nerve hypoplasia may also be affected by refractive errors, accommodation and convergence, strabismus, and abnormal saccade function. There may be loss of visual acuity, loss of contrast sensitivity, loss of peripheral visual field. There may be defects in or loss of color vision and photophobia. How do we intervene? We should not delay intervention for diagnosis. There are early multidisciplinary intervention services. There may be optical interventions, medical and surgical, non-optical, and other educational interventions. This is a team approach. Ophthalmological interventions include medical and surgical, and are dependent on the evaluation of each child and not just a diagnosis. Some children with esotropia may benefit from strabismus surgery. Patching may be useful in treating some cases of unilateral vision loss with superimposed amblyopia. Optical devices such as glasses for refractive errors to treat accommodative deficiencies as well as low vision devices may be helpful. Children can be taught to wear glasses with modeling and behavior modifications shown in this slide on the left by a child using a baby doll as a model and in the middle and on the right using service animals that help our children with autism to learn to wear their glasses. 
In regards to educational and environmental interventions, there is an individual approach for each child. The child may benefit from reduced glare, diffuse lighting, reduced clutter, simplification of the environment, higher contrast, consistency in presentation and language, introduction of new items gradually, using an initial visual field preference, using routines and repetition. Again, this is an individual approach for each child. We need to capitalize on other senses in the learning process. Movement sometimes can help catch visual attention. Visual fluctuations may occur with fatigue and in varied environmental conditions. Lighting is important and again simplifying the environment and distractions during learning time with proper positioning is important. A play corner or multidisciplinary room may be helpful. Developmental delays and risk factors for developmental delays include hypoplasia of the corpus callosum and hypothyroid. Developmental delays are common and there's a wide spectrum. Three-fourths of the children may have neuropsychiatric disorder, some with autism and attention deficit disorder. Motor delays may occur in 75%, including cerebral palsy and global delays. Communication delays may occur in 44% as in autism and also other speech disorders. Remember again, the absence of septum pellucidum is not a risk factor for developmental delays or visual impairment. like to just talk about a couple of children who presented with optic nerve hypoplasia. In this case, a 10-month-old young man with optic nerve hypoplasia, hydrocephalus with multiple shunt revisions and medically fragile, was brought by his birth to 3T. They had noted he had no vision in the midline, but they felt he had vision in the periphery. He was found to have strabismus with cross fixation with one eye looking to the right field and the other to the left and he was unable to straighten his eyes in the midline. He had been told by a pediatric ophthalmologist he was blind and may need to be institutionalized because of disabilities. After this, of course, the parents hear nothing can be done, surgery is cosmetic only, and nothing will really matter. In this case, the child sought a second opinion. He was, ended up being stable enough to go ahead with strabismus surgery for the esotropia. The eyes were brought to midline, and the day following surgery, he was actually able to fixate on his mother's face, see objects in the midline, and make eye contact. This case emphasizes the importance of proper assessment and treatment of coexisting ocular disease. In this second case, this was a young woman with unilateral visual loss, cognitively typical developing, no developmental delays. She presented with strabismus in one eye only. Amblyopia therapy was not successful. Strabismus surgery was performed for cosmetic reasons only. She developed good monocular visual functioning. She learned to drive at the same time as her peers. She's currently in professional school. She had panhypopituitarism associated with unilateral optic nerve hypoplasia. This case emphasizes the medical considerations that go along with this eye condition. The children must be monitored for hypothalamic dysfunction. The syndrome of optic nerve hypoplasia is one of miswiring of the brain manifest in the optic nerves and hypothalamus. MRI scanning can rule out other treatable conditions and is used to anticipate possible developmental delay attributed to other brain malformations. However, remembering that MRI scanning can often miss panhypopituitarism because the pituitary gland can appear normal. Endocrinology workup in these children is very important. In this case, this child needed supplemental cortisol injection during time of illness or physical stress. 
How long do we follow these kids for endocrine problems? No one really knows. And in a third case, I recently saw a baby where absence of corpus callosum was noted on prenatal ultrasound. The child had arrested hydrocephalus and was monitored closely. Endocrine abnormalities were not suspected. At age two months, the child was examined and found to have optic nerve hypoplasia and endocrine workup initiated. The child has improving nystagmus and poor eye contact, but this case emphasizes the importance of examination of the optic nerves in high-risk infants, and in this case, one with another congenital brain malformation. The ocular findings help to direct further medical workup. There are online resources for parents. Some may be out of date. You may want to help your families navigate the internet. What do they see and how do they respond to what they read? There is evidence-based material available online, especially through apost.org and Blind Babies Foundation. There are handouts in Spanish, and part of our job is addressing misinformation and guilt. There is research currently looking at optic nerve hypoplasia and associated endocrine dysfunctions such as hypothyroidism, growth hormone deficiency, sleep dysfunctions, autism in children with visual impairment, and to understand the associations of vision, endocrine, and neurological status with developmental outcome in children with optic nerve hypoplasia. Stem cell research is ongoing and the families and vision professionals should be aware of deception, false claims, and large sums of money. What is the real story? There's no evidence that stem cell therapy at this time improves visual acuity in children with optic nerve hypoplasia. There's been no demonstrated change in pupillary examination, optic nerve measurements, and visual acuity was the same whether the child had stem cell intervention or not. In summary, the rehabilitation issues for children with optic nerve hypoplasia involve improving image quality and use of residual vision. This is a non-progressive disorder. Sometimes acuity improves, and certainly use of residual vision can be improved with early intervention. Glasses may be necessary to treat associated refractive errors. We should look for accommodative difficulties from neurological reasons or medications. Low, division, low vision devices may be useful. We may be able to treat superimposed amblyopia with patching. Strabismus surgery may be indicated and teaching scanning skills is important. Environmental modifications depend on the degree of visual impairment. We should improve contrast for all children with low vision. Positioning is important. We need to decrease glare and keep safety and independence at the top of the list. The role of the interventionist depends on the degree of visual impairment. This is teamwork. We need the medical and educational disciplines working together. Teachers need to be aware of the medical implications that might affect learning in the classroom. Some things that might be unique to optic nerve hypoplasia rehabilitation include early motor skill development and poor acclimation to food textures. Eating issues are common. There are often multi-sensory issues. Sleep regulation may be a problem, and sometimes low-dose melatonin is helpful. We need to help develop residual vision to improve overall development, and also visual acuity may actually slightly improve in the first four years. And remembering there are hormonal and very serious medical issues. Is there a treatment? Our treatment involves early intervention, family intervention, counseling, and support. We need to train the use of residual vision 
and not predict visual outcome at birth or infancy. Early intervention with the multidisciplinary team is important. Thank you for your attention.